you know, nobody got injured. Everybody loved the experience. And I just left kind of like floating on clouds that like, oh, that was so amazing. And just, it, it still happens sometimes. I'll be nervous. And especially because I haven't started the 2019 season yet, I'll get kind of nervous the first couple of hikes. And then I'm just like, oh, it's so fulfilling. And I have so much fun doing it that it, it totally helps to counteract that. Welcome to the Torpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow torpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, please welcome your host, Shane. Hi everybody, it's Shane. I'm back from Berlin, back from the wonderful Arrival event, and I'm delighted to bring you a fresh installment of the Tourpreneur podcast. Today, it's episode six. I'm delighted to bring you a story. Again, what I'm learning so much about you tourpreneurs is how you're combining your passions with the business. And we're going to hear it again today with Miranda Peterson. We're going to learn how she combines her love of yoga, the outdoors, and hiking and learn how she built a company called Namaste in Nature. Or is that Namaste in Nature? We'll find out. And don't forget, you can find all the links to all the resources we mentioned in today's interview. You can find that at tourpreneur.com forward slash six, as in the number six, tourpreneur.com forward slash six. You're doing something a little bit different down there in Asheville. Can you share that with us? Uh, Absolutely. So my company takes guests out on a unique yoga, hiking, and meditation experience. So each experience lasts about two to three hours, and we take the guests on a two to three mile safe guided hike that includes a waterfall or mountain view. And we also include a short guided meditation and a 60 minute yoga class. Both of these are inclusive of beginners. Uh, We also include the outdoor yoga mats for people to borrow, and we take pictures and share them with guests afterwards. Um, So it's really a unique experience combining a lot of things that I'm passionate about. And we've actually had people that have never done yoga before and never done meditation before come and enjoy these tours. Where did the idea come from to mix a hike with yoga? Well, honestly, I came from the corporate world. I worked um, at an advertising agency and then for a Fortune 500 company for several years. And then I just kind of got burnt out and I decided to travel and backpack India and Southeast Asia for about six months. My parents thought I was crazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't blame I don't blame them. Um, and so Part yeah, but I watched your epic video on your website today and I loved the sea turtles. I mean, this nice. doesn't like, you know, <laughs> you just went backpacking around the world. You got to take care of sea turtles. I did sea turtles and elephants. It was really important me, to me to kind of really be involved with the, the local culture and to kind of give back while I was traveling. So in addition to volunteering with sea turtles and elephants, and um, I did my yoga teacher training in India and it was a 200 hour training took about four weeks. And yeah, this experience just kind of changed my life. I also went hiking in the Himalayas. I went hiking um, in the Andes in Peru. Um, And so I got back to the States and I was kind of like, well, what do I do now? And just wanted to figure out something that combined all of my passions. And this is what came out. (laughs) Well, you know, your parents must be pretty proud of you because these are incredible things to go and experience around the world. It's not like you are backpacking and just staying in hostels and hitting bars every night. I mean, to go on some of the hikes you've been on and the experiences of meditating with monks, et cetera, uh, that really does broaden the mind. Yeah, definitely. And I just got so many insights while I was traveling and ideas and I journaled and it's, it's, I didn't have the idea at all before I left. I wasn't even sure I was going to teach yoga when I came back, even though I was doing the yoga training, but things just kind of fell into place. And someone mentioned, um, that yoga hikes were a thing. And I was like, what? I want to do that. So I started exploring it and experimenting and it worked out. 
Did you go on anyone else's yoga hikes before you set up yourself? Um, no, I kind of just invented it, kind of went with my intuition. So I tested the concept with some meetup groups uh, for free. And so I, I would scout the locations in advance and then um, promote the events and see who showed up. And it was just donation based uh, just to get comfortable doing it because I didn't really have a benchmark or anything to go off of. And then, uh, slowly started putting some events on Eventbrite and people signed up for them and paid for them. So I was like, okay, well now I have to get legit and get permits and get a website and get all of those things going. And yeah, it's just grown from there. I started in 2017, just kind of experimenting on the weekends while I was still working, um, during the week at a design job and just each year it's taken up a little bit more of my time and grown and I'm really excited. Yeah, absolutely. And when you set up with the meetup groups, which I, th I think is a fantastic idea. I know Jennifer also at Ash Asheville Hiking Tours did mm -hmm. the same thing. And I was like, oh, wow, that, that makes complete sense. Was there any feedback you got at that time, which kind of changed your perception? Or was there anything surprising that kind of challenged how you thought a yoga hike should be that you then implemented into your business? Yeah, well, my my main insight didn't really come from the guests themselves, but uh, I did I did give some feedback on the form asking how much they'd be willing to pay for a tour like this. And a lot of people skipped that question, interestingly enough. So I think it, it, it kind of dawned on me at that point that this was going to be, you know, targeted more towards tourists and people visiting Asheville versus people that live here. And you know, can go hiking anytime and don't perhaps, you know, see the full value of the experience. So for tourpreneurs who are listening into the show today, how did you then go about coming up with a, a pricing structure? Because obviously what you're doing is quite unique and it's custom. So it's not like, Hey, you know, there's walking tours at New York and they charge 20 bucks a throw. How did you go about coming up with the pricing model? Yeah, that was actually pretty difficult um, because I didn't have much to compare it to. I was like, do I price it similar to a yoga studio? Because, you know, you are getting a yoga class. Do I price it similar to other hiking tours? And so I just kind of experimented with that number a little bit and um, just and obviously wanted to cover my expenses as well. So that took a lot of puzzling to kind of figure out. And I think it's in a good place now, but I, I didn't know right away. And of, of course I wasn't profitable my first year because it was kind of more of a hobby. So, um, so yeah, it just, it takes a little while to figure out. Yeah. And I think also what I hear from a lot of entrepreneurs is, is because this is something that they're passionate about. They're very nervous about when it comes to the money side of things. Was, was that something you also went through? Absolutely. Yeah. I want it to be accessible to people and affordable, um, but also to be able to make a living. You know, I want to have a profitable business and there's kind of a unique sentiment in a lot of the yoga and wellness community. There are some people that think you shouldn't have to pay for um, yoga and wellness and, you know, more spiritual type um, activities, but you know, there, there are a lot of costs involved that you have to cover and just kind of taking all that into account and just playing with that number. And, and, you know, I've adjusted it every year since 2017. So it, and I do, you know, group discounts. So if you have more people, it can be a slightly lower rate. So there's kind of different ways you can, you can play with the numbers. Yeah. This, this is a subject that I want to tackle on future episodes as well. And at the time of recording, I'm flying out to Berlin in a few days to the arrival events, the first one they're holding in, in Germany. And I'm really keen to find out from other tourpreneurs how they come up with pricing strategies for, especially those that are running something that's a bit more custom. Um, and then obviously bring that uh, knowledge back onto the show at some point that, that can help all of us. Because I, I agree with you, I think it can be challenging at the start. The other challenging thing at the beginning, of course, is I think we all have this, which is overcoming, overcoming the, the fear and the little voice in your head, the imposter syndrome. Was that something you experienced, Miranda? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I still struggle with imposter syndrome. You know, at the beginning, I, I was working full time. And, you know, like I say, I just kind of did these on weekends and, you know, it kind of proved the concept. But at the same time in my head, it was like, why are you doing this? Like it's, you know, that little, that little self-sabotaging voice that tells you it's not going to work. And it was a fluke. And, 
you know, what about the weather and just kind of throwing up all these barriers as to why you shouldn't do something. And you just kind of have to keep overcoming that and doing it. And one of the things that really kept me motivated was after each yoga hike, um, the guests were just like amazed. They just had such a wonderful experience because there's so many health benefits to hiking outdoors, to yoga, to meditation, and just combining all of these things really created like a pleasant, relaxing experience, which I think people are really craving these days because we're so busy. We're always multitasking. We're always attached to our phones. And like, it's rare that people can just disconnect and get outside and really enjoy the environment around them and be really present. So I I wanted to ask you, you obviously went through a meetup and event, right? What were some of the bigger challenges you faced when you decided that, okay, I've done my research, there's a need for this, there could be a business here. What other challenges did you then experience as you got going? Well, the biggest challenges were A, figuring out the permits system and everything I had to do to set that up and to do everything legally and go through the right channels. So that was a process. I had to get liability insurance. I had to apply for the permits and go through all that. I had to Um, make sure my first aid and um, CPR training was up to date. Yeah, the second step was hiring more guides. So I actually was really lucky. I've had several people reach out to me and say, I'm a yoga teacher. I love being outside. Like, I'd love to be a guide for you. So I haven't had to really try that hard to recruit um, additional guides, but figuring out how to do that and how to um, interview them was kind of interesting. So I actually, I had about, uh, four or five other guides last year that would help me out. I still did the majority of the tours myself, but I did have some help. And then I had tryouts at the end of last year that I promoted through my website and my social media channel. And I got four additional guides that were really great. We did kind of a test hike and they each taught part of a yoga class and their personalities were great. They were really excited. And yeah, I'm looking forward to, having even more guides this year. Yeah. And this is something, again, I hear a lot of with, with recruiting within uh, the tour world is it really does come down to passion and having passion for the subject, whether it's a ghost tour in Charleston or a battlefield site tour in the Netherlands, it's about having passion for the subject. That's what uh, we're looking for when we're hiring. Absolutely. Having, having passion is super helpful and also just making guests feel welcome, making them feel heard and just doing whatever you can to make it a wonderful experience, whether it's giving them some extra information, giving them restaurant recommendations, taking pictures for them, just anything that makes them feel welcome and relaxed and safe and just have a wonderful experience. You, you talked about the unsexy things of starting up a tour business, which is liability and permitting, et cetera. So if I understand correctly, you, you would have had to get the permitting because you're on national park land or federal land. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Where all the great vistas are and the waterfalls are and the established trails. That's another thing. Um, I want it to be nice and safe. I didn't want to be bushwhacking through, <laughs> through trails that I didn't know and that could possibly be unsafe. Um, and you know, there's a reason there's trails there because it's really nice views or nice waterfalls. So I want people to be able to experience that. And then we kind of have our little secret spots off the trails where we do the yoga. And in, in terms of the permitting process, uh, I know it's quite a dry subject, but for tourpreneurs or, or tourpreneurs in waiting that are listening to the show, do you have any advice for people who are going to have to go through that process? Is there anything you would have done differently or what, you know, just general tips for people? Um, start as early as possible because it takes a while. And a lot of times these government websites and the information is just like really old and outdated and, you know, to no fault of their own, they usually have very, you know, limited staff to work on these things, but a lot of the technology is old and the websites can be clunky and it takes a while to send the paperwork and, and get it back, especially when it's your first time. Uh, renewing it, it gets easier each time. So that's the light at the end of the tunnel. But um, yeah, just kind of going through all the steps and allowing yourself as much time as possible. But if you don't have a ton of time and you're already in the middle of the season, just kind of do it whenever you can. You know, I kept thinking, oh, it's, you know, 
not the right time. I'll wait till this and that. But if you keep making excuses, then you'll kind of never do it. And there's never a perfect time. So just start whenever you can. No, I think that that's good advice. Do you feel, is there any support? And this may be, you know, depending on where we all live, but was there any support for you from chambers of commerce or any organizations around Asheville? I actually had a friend who had applied. So I asked, you know, kind of some of her advice, but um, had to figure it out on my own and get specific insurance for my activities because the insurance varies based on the activities you're doing, whether it's hiking or horseback riding or fishing, there's kind of different viability insurance requirements for those activities. So I had to figure out, um, what I was doing, where I was going to do it, and then what I needed in order to be able to do that. What's the best thing that's happened to you since you started the tours? I guess just the fulfillment not only is it fulfilling, but I also kind of discovered um, a shortcut or almost like a backdoor to get people interested in yoga and meditation. So I discovered that a lot of people from, from talking to guests on my tours, I discovered that a lot of them are intimidated to go to a yoga studio or they're intimidated to even go to a gym and try yoga class. They feel like they are the only one that won't know the poses. We won't know what's going on. And um, you know, they won't be as flexible as everyone else. And so by, um, them being on vacation, they are kind of more open-minded and willing to try things they wouldn't normally try. And also just being outside and being around people that they know, and just being in that, that vacation mindset, they're more willing to, to try these things. And so I'm like, if we give them a really great experience, maybe they'll continue doing yoga and meditation and appreciating nature outside when they go home. So you're up and running as a business. Tell us about the very first tour that you led. So the first paid tour with your business. What was that like for you? Well, it was a bachelorette party that was in town for the weekend. They were really great. I was so nervous when I was driving over there. And I was like, again, the imposter syndrome came up. It was like, oh, you know, this isn't a real business. Um, they're going to find out. And um you know, they're going to like want their money back or something like all these illogical thoughts Oral, going through my head. Yeah. And then I get there and as soon as I meet them and start talking to them, I just get this energy and we hiked, you know, we took pictures of the waterfall. We meditated at the waterfall, which is an amazing experience. We did the yoga class and then we went back to the parking lot. You know, nobody got injured. Everybody loved the experience. Um, and I just left kind of like floating on clouds that like, oh, that was so amazing. And just it, it still happens sometimes. I'll be nervous. And especially because I haven't started the 2019 season yet, I'll get kind of nervous the first couple of hikes. And then I'm just like, oh, it's so fulfilling. And I have so much fun doing it that it, it totally helps to counteract that. Did you know every weekday Shane curates the most interesting news articles in tours and activities and sends them out in a snappy daily digest? Grab your copy of the Tourpreneur Daily Briefing at www.tourpreneur.com. Yeah, this is something I hear from all tourpreneurs. So you're not alone for sure. Um, we all go through it. And I actually think the nerves is a good thing, you know, within reason, because I think it helps us to deliver the best experience that we can because we are nervous. I think when you go in and you just, you know, there's no butterflies, then that's when things can go wrong, I find. Yeah, yeah. And I definitely learn something new on each tour. And I think I learn as much from the guests as as they learn from me. And it's just a really great, um, mutually beneficial experience. So how do you, if we switch tracks here a little bit and talk a bit about marketing and, and uh, promotion, how do you get the word out about your tours? I try lots of things. <laughs> I, I try to take uh, my past experience from the advertising and marketing world and apply that. And thankfully, I'm in an industry like yoga and outdoors that's really popular on Instagram, social media. So I invested a lot of time in my Instagram account and my Facebook account. I have a decent following on there. And I also, you know, I've explored every avenue I can find here, uh, whether it's the Asheville Visitor and Convention Bureau or Yelp, uh, TripAdvisor, um, Airbnb experiences. Uh, I've, ex I've explored everything I possibly can. I also uh, designed and launched my own website and I use Fair Harbor for that booking 
So it's, it's a little bit of everything and constantly evaluating that too, to see what's working and doing more of what's working and getting rid of what's not working. And are most of your customers finding you through your social media or? Um, I've had a few people specifically tell me. So um, I'd say one really important thing with marketing is when people sign up to have a question, how did you hear about us? Um, So you find out where people are finding you and you don't have to guess. Some people have specifically said Instagram or, you know, Facebook or something. Um, I also promote the tours on Facebook. So the biggest, I think, sources have been, oh, I also have done some Google AdWords and yeah, just explored everything. I think the most successful right now is Airbnb and Google and just my website. I've, I've started writing content. So I started a blog six months ago and I release a new post every Friday and that's really helped to drive some more traffic to the website and also help keep customers engaged because a lot of times, you know, maybe they'll come one season and I'll never see them again. So it's a challenge to keep, you know, those seasonal and those tourist customers engaged. So in terms of Airbnb experiences, that's something I know very little about. Can you share with us how that works? Airbnb experiences, I think it's been around for a while in other cities, but it just launched where I am last summer. And it's 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 pretty similar to the accommodation booking. And what's great about it is that there's already this huge established network of people that are traveling. So uh, I like that you're marketing directly to your target, to people who are visiting Asheville or whatever city you're in and are looking for things to do. So it really made a lot of sense for them to pursue this channel. And I put my business on there last summer and got a lot of business through it. And what's your interaction been like with Airbnb? Did somebody call you and and find out more about your tours or was it all automated online? How did that look? (laughs) To be honest, I was kind of stalking them for a while because I'd known it existed and I was waiting for it to come to Asheville. And so when it did, I just jumped on and was one of the first people to sign up and create an experience because I knew I wanted to try to get in on the ground floor. And then after that, um, after I'd had a few tours and had some reviews. Um, I saw that they were looking for an experience leader for the city. So each city has kind of a leader that um, maintains a Facebook group for all the other um, experience leaders in the Asheville area or whatever city you're in and also plans kind of a quarterly meetup to create more of a community around uh, experience leaders. That's a really good idea. I didn't know they, they did that. Um, yeah, I applied for, I had to apply for that. It was kind of a process actually, and it's not paid, it's volunteer, but, um, yeah, I had to submit a video and then do a live interview and, wow. um, yeah, so it was, it was kind of a process, but it's great. Cause I've got to meet a lot of other fellow entrepreneurs and tour guides in the Asheville area. Yeah. And I have to say on, first of all, your, your website is beautiful, by the way, it's, it's a stunning website. Um, Thank you. Was that, so did you design and develop that yourself? I did. I use Squarespace. I've used them for years for my websites and other websites I've designed for clients and I have no complaints. Um, I love them. I, they've been like super easy to use and they have great support and they have a lot of videos that show you how to do specific things. And I mean, my website now is not my website three years ago. It's, it's changed significantly. And I wish I had screen caps I could share to compare the before and after, but you know, there's, it's, a, it's, there's a link I can share with you afterwards. I'll put it on the show notes. I think it's called the way, Bo- way back when machine or something. And you go in and you tap in your URL and it's quite embarrassing. It's like looking at old photographs of when you were a kid, uh, cause it shows you your website from years gone by. Wow. It takes a screenshot of it. It's really quite scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know if I want to see that. Yeah. Um, but that's what I think is important to remember is, you know, it's, it's a work in progress, your website, it's going to change and evolve as your business kind of changes and evolves. And if you feel comfortable managing that, then it's great, but you can also, you know, there's a lot of resources out there that you can hire to create your website, but it's also great that you can kind of make your own. So 
Yeah, no, I really liked it. And, you know, I think it's in keeping with your brand and what you're attempting to do. I also liked the video. I thought that was very vibrant. I think it explained uh, exactly what, what you offer. I, how, how did that video come about? Uh, I did that myself. Really? I, yeah, I had my boyfriend hold the camera and I kind of wrote out the questions. I had my business coach actually write out some questions that she thought would be beneficial for customers. And then I answered those on camera and I did all of the editing and graphics. Again, because that's my background. I'm very um, fortunate that I've had a background in creative work and that I can do a lot of these things uh, for myself. And yeah, I just kind of had a list of things I wanted to do. I had, had to get the website, I had to get the booking, had to do video, social media, blog posts. So it's all kind of accumulated over the years. And, you know, once you kind of master one thing and get comfortable in one area, then you can, you can branch out to others and, and see how it all works together and experiment. And I think that's the most fun is I'm constantly experimenting. I'm constantly learning um, instead of, you know, being in an office and being told what to do and when to be there, I kind of uh, set my own schedule and decide what needs to be done, which, you know, that's a double edged sword because sometimes it's really easy and, you know, you need to do certain things. And other days you're just kind of overwhelmed with all the things that you feel like you have to do. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot to, to just, you know, looking at your social media channels and, and creating good content for that rather than just putting any old rubbish on it because people can tell if you're just adding stuff for the sake of it right so that's that's almost a full-time job in itself and I constantly marvel when I hear that you made that video yourself filmed it edited it etc because the technology that is available to us now um, it, it's just incredible what we can put together I mean, if you go back just 10 years to put that video together would have been a four-figure sum to pay someone for sure Exactly. I mean, to do any of this stuff that I've done to build a website, to do a video, to, um, you know, get into all these marketing channels. Yeah, it's, it's, I see it again, kind of as a double-edged sword, like on one end, it's very, it's a lot more accessible and you can do a lot more things by yourself, but then there's so many more things to do. I wonder what tours were like maybe back in the eighties when you had a few ads and maybe a a listing in the phone book and didn't have to deal with, you know, all of the things that we, we deal with today. Yeah, absolutely. There is a panel I'm moderating at Arrival Berlin, um, which is about the tour operator of the future. And, you know, there is a chap there who runs tours to Venice and now he's expanding to not just, you know, jumping on a gondola and taking pictures. You can go on wine tasting in Venice or make the masks. You can go and do that yourself. So a lot more about the experience um, of the tours. And it's really interesting how I think you need this technology to explain it. Uh, whereas, you know, like you say, 20 years ago, it would be the standard walk tour, bike tour. Yeah, it's amazing. Actually, I feel like I've had more private bookings than uh, public bookings for yoga hikes. I get a lot of uh, women's groups, especially bachelorette parties and girls weekend groups and birthdays and a lot of women that are celebrating something or in transition. And that's been, that's been really great to create this special experience for them and share pictures. And that's kind of, that's another great piece of advice I have for other tourpreneurs is to get lots of pictures from your tour because that creates a lot of content that you can use in blog posts and in marketing and in social media. You also mentioned business coaching, uh, something I really would be interested in learning a bit more about. How does that look for you? Well, I have actually tried about four different coaches until I found the right one. So I actually found um, a business coach that specializes in yoga businesses here in Asheville. And her name's Mado Hesselink, and she has a whole um, yoga teacher resource podcast and Facebook group and just really helped me uh, focus because my, I guess, my challenge in the past has been uh, being all over the place. You know, I trained in, in being creative and coming up with lots of ideas. And that's kind of where I was last year. I was just like, oh, let me do this thing and that thing. And I was just all over the place, just spreading myself too thin. And once I started working with her, um, she really got me focused and kept me on task. And it's just great since I run this company by myself, it's great to have somebody to talk with and bounce ideas off of and get feedback from. You said that you, you, you've gone through four coaches. 
What was it about the others that just didn't jive with you? Um, it was different things. So the first coach was kind of more of a life coach and didn't have uh, a ton of business experience. And I'd kind of had a few sessions with him when I got back from traveling. I was like, well, now what? Because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And then I had uh, my second coach was one of my yoga students uh, in the city I taught in before Asheville. And she was great, but again, had more of an academic background and was kind of more on the life coaching side. And then the third coaches, they were more, again, with like the life coach side. So it was kind of hard to find um, a specific business coach. And then I got introduced to Mado through another yoga teacher that who I specifically asked for mentoring somebody who'd been here for a long time and owned her own studio and thought she, I started reaching out to people and she directed me to um, my current coach who I've worked with for months and been super happy with. I, I love hearing this because I think it's so important if you're going to spend, you know, good money with a coach, they have to, you have to gel with them. They have to kind of you know, know your business, know your goals in order to give you that right advice. And you, know, you just got to go into Google and tap coach, business coach, whatever it may be. And there are thousands of people out there. Um, and it's so important to interview your coach. You know, you really need to grill your future coach. Yeah, exactly. Because it is a, a significant investment. And once you, it's, it's just amazing because I've had kind of both experiences where there's nothing wrong with the other coaches. It just wasn't the right fit for the needs that I had. Um, and they didn't have kind of the right experience. So they gave good advice, just not specifically for what kind of I was looking for. And, and I am inventing kind of a new business that people aren't familiar with. So, you know, having a coach that's more versed in yoga and working with, um, you know, yoga businesses has been super helpful. And it just takes, you know, trial and error like anything else in the business. Well, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that when entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs who, who are, you know, interested in yoga, listen to this show, they might be reaching out to you for some coaching, Miranda, because they may want to <laughs> have a, a yoga and hike tour in the Highlands of Scotland and think, hey, that's the woman I want to work with because no one else is doing this. So yeah. there, there are, I've, I've been following on social media. That's another great benefit of social media is you can kind of see um, what other people are doing and, and kind of benchmark. There are a few other people that do yoga hikes, but not in the same way or to the same extent uh, that I do. So it's really great for, for inspiration. Brilliant. I mean, I really do advise, again, this is all down to budget. If you, if you have $0 in budget, then, you know, you can't afford a coach. Then in that case, go to the library and get some books out, especially the ones that our guests recommend. But if you do have budget for it, I just think it really does flatten the learning curve. When I started podcasting, I, I worked with two pod, uh, podcast coaches and that just saved me so much, you know, frustration in getting started. But on the other hand, you know, I have spent, I remember in the past, I spent $5,000 with a coach, sales coach in my corporate career. And it was a complete disaster because he just did not understand the online world. He was great at old school selling, you know, from factories, et cetera. But when he didn't understand the net and it was a complete waste of money. Never miss an episode of the show. Subscribe at torpreneur.com forward slash subscribe. What was it about Fair Harbor? Why did you decide to, to work with Fair Harbor? Well, I'm trying to automate as much as possible. And it came highly recommended from other friends, such as Alice and Jennifer. And um, just everyone else I knew that had her companies raved about it and said the customer service was great. And I'm in the very beginning stages. So I just switched over the winter from using Eventbrite, which I used for the first two years, of my business to using Fair Harbor this year. And um, it's been pretty good so far. Setting up the private tours was a little bit of a challenge the way that I wanted to do it. But um, I mean, they've been a great team to work with. And I mean, time will tell this year, but I think it's going to take a lot of time off of my plate and automate a lot of things and just let allow me to focus on on other things versus bookings and um, sending emails. Like last year, I actually, <laughs> I was using MailChimp and I would physically enter all of the email addresses and physically send a follow-up email. Yeah, I was doing it all manually. Wow. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to save me a lot of time. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. It's really neat. So you've got the Appalachian Trail Mountain Yoga Hiking Tour, Blue Ridge Parkway, Epic Waterfall, gift cards, 
and then your, your private tours and then your calendar availability. Yeah. Gift cards are great too. Good to, to push those um, around holidays and just have another option for people to share with friends and family. If they have a great experience, then they can share a gift card with another friend, like friends or family that are going to visit the Asheville area. So I've, I, that was another selling point for me was that I could do gift cards really easily. Curious if you've thought about working, for instance, you know, with, with TripAdvisor so that when people are searching for things to do and excursions in Asheville, that you would come up on their site as well. Yeah, I've looked into that. Um, and it's just a matter of figuring out how much you're going to lose, basically, yeah, the percentage yeah. that they take from that. And um, again, it comes back to pricing. Figuring, I'm trying to keep consistent pricing across all platforms. So I'd be, you know, losing 20% on different networks, uh, which I, it's Airbnb experiences also takes 20%. So I, it's, that's that kind of sounds like an industry standard. You'd probably know more about that than I do. In fact, I, I read about it going even more than that, increasing. So uh, as the OTAs, as we, you mentioned earlier on, that you have done some Google AdWords and they, they spend millions on that. Um, how, how has your experience been with Google Ads? Uh, again, trial and error, experimenting with uh, different offers and different combinations of words and kind of seeing what worked. Uh, once I got my business coach, I was really able to narrow down my target market um, which is women 30 to 60 in transition, whether it's, you know, I've, I always talk to the women on my tours and sometimes they're going through a divorce or they're going back to school or they're having kids or their kids are leaving home and um, they're just kind of doing something for themselves. And so that really helped inform my marketing and my advertising to be a lot more targeted. And it's funny because when I first started, I had no, I was completely off at uh, thinking about, um, who my target market was, despite, you know, all of my marketing background, I thought it was going to be like young 20 somethings that were on Instagram and wanted to come do yoga and take pretty pictures and just post them on Instagram. But I've really gotten a lot more uh, diverse crowd and an older crowd and even men, I'd say probably like 5% men, usually husbands that are brought by their wives. But um, we definitely welcome anyone that wants to come. And I'm really happy with the diversity um, of people that have come on these tours with age and with background, people from all over the U.S. Um, still waiting for some, for some international guests, but yes. um, they'll come one day. So you were saying you, you have a lot of projects on, you spread yourself a bit thin. I'm always curious with productivity and if there's any tips you have or any tools you use in order to be more productive at work. Absolutely. Well, first of all, was um, determining my ideal work environment. So some people like to work from home. Some people like to work in coffee shops. And neither of those really worked for me. When I was working at home, I was a little too close to my bed and naps were a little too accessible. And working in a coffee shop was a little too distracting. And I just didn't like feeling the pressure to always have to buy something to eat or drink. And so the right fit for me was finding a co-working space and I think that's been integral to my productivity. Um, I'm actually here recording right now in one of the private rooms, but they also have tons of um, desks available and it's really affordable. And it still kind of gives me um, that feeling of going to work and okay, I'm in work mode now, kind of separating um, work and life balance. But also I have the flexibility, you know, I can come uh, whenever I need to, I try to come in Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday and make those really productive days and have Monday and Friday a little more flexible for scouting trails or leading yoga hikes or meeting with clients and doing different things. And it's also beneficial, like Google calendars, I'll say, has saved my life. I put everything on my Google calendar. If it's not on my Google right. calendar, it's not happening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I guess with your yoga background, maybe I don't know if I need to ask this, but how do you strive to get a good work-life balance? Yeah, it's, I need to practice what I preach, right? So um, I do make time on my Google calendar. I will schedule the yoga classes that I plan to go to. I also teach at a local studio here, um, which is also great networking and you know, potential customers sometimes mention, oh, you know, I do yoga hikes. If you guys would like to know more, you know, let me know because they're already in yoga class. So they'd probably like a yoga hike. Um, and I, I do, I do make an effort to, you know, go to the gym, go to yoga classes. I meditate every morning, 
and you know, I also allow myself some days I just realize I'm just not, it's just one of those days. I'm not going to get much done. It's not going to be productive. Um, and you just kind of have to allow those once in a while. And then the next day I'm usually like extra productive, but just kind of being, um, just kind of being gentle with yourself and realizing you're still a human and, um, you need to take that time for self care and, you know, watching your health kind of eating right and just really taking care of yourself. Cause if you can't take care of yourself, you're not gonna be able to take care of your business if you're sick and you're, you know, stressed out and have anxiety. And, um, another thing I've done to deal with anxiety about my business is if I have something come up, I'll go, I have a Google doc and say, um, you know, I'm anxious about somebody falling and getting injured. Then I write out that question because it likely, it's likely to happen. I've only had one sprained ankle in the three years I've been doing this, but you know, I write down, okay, somebody will get injured. And then I kind of write the solution to that saying, okay, if somebody gets injured, this is why we're all trained in first aid and CPR. So instead of that, just being like a question in my head, like nagging at me, I write it down and write the solution. And then you kind of have a plan if something happens in the future, I just go to my document. And I'm like, okay, I thought about this before and here's what I'm going to do about it. And that kind of helps take away some of the stress and anxiety as well. That's great advice. Are there any books that you've read either when you were starting out or, or indeed now that have been you know, a great help to you in your business? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one book was It Takes a Tribe. And I can't remember the author, but he's the guy that started Tough Mudder, which was, you've heard of Tough Mudder? I have. Yeah. yeah. Those events. And, um, so it takes a tribe was really interesting about how to build a tribe and keep people engaged and just build something that people really get excited about and really believe in and want to be a part of. Um, I also wrote a book, I mean, wrote a book, read a book about, um, yoga entrepreneurship. So that was really specific to my industry. Again, a lot of the things that come up around yoga teachers with feeling guilty for asking to be paid for these kind of services. Um, and it just kind of goes through a little bit of everything like marketing and logistics and, you know, overcoming those blocks that we tend to have when it comes to business and just money in general. Yeah. yeah. That imposter syndrome and coming up saying, why are you charging this much? You know? <laughs> and, um, yeah. What's the name of that book? Uh, let me see. Uh, if you want to email at me afterwards, I, I can add it to the show notes. And to our listeners, you can find all the links we mentioned today at tourpreneur.com forward slash six. And yeah, I or I can just, I can't think of all of them now. I have my, I turned my cell phone off per the rules and I have, I, I, I have use strict rules here in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I use Audible and I have a whole list of all the books I've listened to. So I'd love to like share those with Brilliant. you afterwards. And you can just say, I, I could just say like, I have a bunch of books that you can list below because I can't think of all of them off the top of my head. Fantastic. No, I'd love to, I'd love to do that. I love sharing books. I think Audible is just one of the best things for for entrepreneurs. Obsessed with Audible. Yeah. And that's, it's inspirational as well. I have a lot of podcasts and a lot of, a lot of podcasts I listen to and a lot of books that I listen to, especially because I have so much driving to the trailheads, driving all these places. So I try to fill that time uh, productively with podcasts and Audible audio, audio books. Yeah, they, they really make you, uh, they inspire you and, and give you something different to think about. I'm currently listening to, I think it's called Shoe Dog, which is the story of Nike. Oh, cool. And you see a brand like that. I had no idea that started in the late 60s and how tough it was for, you know, a guy in Portland, Oregon to set that business up. You always think of Nike as this giant corporation now, which of course they are, but starting out, it was one person, yeah. you know? <laughs> and speaking of that, two resources I really loved. I read the uh, Steve Jobs autobiography by, I think it was Walter Isaacs. That was really fascinating. Um, and again, like a huge company that we know of Apple today and just to hear kind of where it started. Uh, but another podcast I find really inspiring is How I Built This on NPR Guy Raz interviews uh, different entrepreneurs and you hear the story from the beginning, like when they were struggling and when they like, you know, couldn't pay their bills and when they couldn't eat anything besides spaghetti and then kind of now where they are today. And it's, you know, great to hear not just the success, but also the failures and the obstacles that they overcame. I love it. I love listening to those because it's so easy to take for granted that, oh yeah, that they, they got lucky or they got successful. It's not the same for me. It's not the same for me. And when you actually do listen to the origin story, like you say, when they're eating ramen and working out the garage, mm-hmm. um, it is very inspirational. 
Um, I wanted to, uh, I'm going to be very conscious of your time here, but I know you offer creative services. Um, so in terms of Instagram, what is your kind of advice for people who are wanting to have a vibrant Instagram channel? And maybe you could share with us some of the services that you offer, because I know you're working with tourpreneurs right now to help them with that side of the business. So I just love learning and have about 10 years of experience in the industry, advertising and marketing and graphic design and just creative work in general. And, you know, not ashamed to admit that my tour business, Namaste Nature, doesn't pay all the bills. So I still do the consulting, uh, creative consulting as a supplement to the income. And I just also really enjoy it. It's a good, a good balance. Yeah. I think the, the first key is determining your target market and what social media platforms your target market is on. So, um, for instance, Instagram tends to skew a little bit younger and it's all about pretty pictures and, um, you know, having like really great photography and, yeah, sometimes people actually read the captions, but mostly people just look at the pictures and see if you can have a really nice, like eye catching aesthetic to grab people's attention and using the right hashtags. Whereas Facebook, you know, can skew a little bit older. And I don't know about everyone else's moms, but my mom is always on Facebook, you know, interacting with people and sharing things, looking at your target market first and seeing what social media channels they use and then investing in those social media channels. Um, but yeah, it is better to focus on one or two than trying to do all of them, especially if you're just sharing the same link to all of them. You want to kind of tailor the content a little bit to the platform to make it successful. So you were saying your audience is women kind of 30 to 60. Where do you find that mm -hmm. audience online? Oh, it's all over. I've been getting a huge increase in web traffic this year. And I think that's just due to being around for three years and people kind of learning about it and people, um, you know, my, my websites moved up in the, the search results when people are searching for things to do in Asheville and, you know, also Instagram has been pretty, um, successful with reaching that target as well as Facebook. Cause some people, you know, I've had several people tell me I don't use Facebook anymore. It's too toxic. Like people just are too mean. And so they only use Instagram. And I feel like personally for my business, um, based on my research, Instagram and Facebook were the right fit. And I also take pictures on every tour. So I have that for content. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's good advice. And you offer services. So you're, you're working with tourpreneurs right now. Where can people find out more about that? Do you have a website for that side of your business or? Absolutely. Uh, MirandaPeterson.com. And there I have examples of everything I've done from logo design and branding to video to, um, you know, kind of consultation and just anything creative. Well, on a future episode of the show, what I would like to do is have a round table, so a panel discussion with various marketers. And I would love to invite you back onto that so we can have a really, you know, it's very hard in these hour interviews and, you know, exploring your journey here to really dig into the marketing. But I would love to have a deep dive in the future with a few different marketing experts. Would you be interested in coming back on for that? I would. Fantastic. So Miranda, are you ready for the quick fire round? Yes, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> we will. And what was the last tour you went on? So not one of your own tours, but another tour that you enjoyed. Oh, this is really great. Uh, so I was traveling a little bit in the off season in the winter uh, to see family and then for the holidays and for my birthday. And my boyfriend and I did a desert safari in Abu Dhabi. So we got to ride in a four wheel drive vehicle and drive over the dunes and go into the desert and have dinner and have a show. It was really amazing. Brilliant. And how did you book that? Uh, I actually booked it through Airbnb experiences, but I think they're on several different platforms um, from what I gathered talking to the guide, because I kind of have a new perspective now going on other guides since I have my own business and I kind of try to pick their brains and get information and share information. That's a solid tip. We should all be doing that. Um, it's a great way to, to find out about marketing. What is your favorite holiday destination? Oh gosh, there's so many. Um, my favorite so far, I really love New Zealand. Um, I love Thailand. I've been there twice. Um, and India, there's just no other place like India. So especially if you're into yoga, meditation, it's um, a place to visit for sure. Which entrepreneur or famous person would you most like to have dinner with? 
Well, I have two. So I used to work for Whole Foods as regional art director, and I would love to meet John Mackey and talk with him um, about his experiences and kind of where they are now since they've been bought by Amazon. It would just be really interesting to pick his brain. And, and he wrote the book Conscious Capitalism about really, you know, trying to make a viable business, but also be really conscious of the environment and of the employees and and just be a really good business. And also Marcia Kilgore. Um, I've listened to her episode on how I built this several times and she created the brand Bliss, the Bliss Spas, um, and also Soap and Glory and Fit Flop. And she has about five companies she's established over the years. They're just hugely successful and she just sounds like an amazing person. I would love for her to be my big sister. Well, I would love to be a fly on the wall of that dinner party because I think you've picked two very interesting guests yes. to share a lot of wisdom. What is your favorite museum or attraction? Uh, my favorite is anything outdoors. Anytime I travel somewhere, I try to do a hike or explore somewhere outside. And I just really feel the most revived and refreshed and relaxed when I'm in nature. And what do you like to read when you're on holiday? Oh, gosh. Um, I like to read whatever book is next in my Audible queue. I have so many, so I kind of get through one and I try to get to the next one. And I'm doing some advanced yoga teacher training right now. So it's a lot of yoga books for that training um, that I'm listening to and learning more about the history. And th there's just so many directions you can go. And there's so many types of yoga. And uh, finally, what is your top travel tip? I think the most important travel tip is to be open-minded, not have too many expectations. Cause I think that's where people get disappointed is when they book an experience or they book a trip and they have a specific idea of what's going to happen and how things should happen and are trying to con control every single little aspect of it. And I think that's why I enjoyed my sabbatical in Asia so much is I didn't really know what I was getting into and was just open to experiencing whatever there was to experience. And so I think that's my top travel tip is to, you know, stay open-minded and just, you know, get ready for an adventure and, and see what happens. That's great advice. Well, Miranda Peterson, thank you very much for coming on to the Tourpreneur Show episode six. Thank you for we, having uh, me. We wish you... All the very best with your business. Awesome. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Torpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit torpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Torpreneur.